blessings to uh, everybody. Hey, listen, uh, as you're coming on, go ahead and invite your, uh, go ahead and invite your followers. Go ahead and invite your followers. I'm, um, I'm not here to prophesy. Uh, I'm actually here to minister to you for a minute. Of course, I know that prophecy is ministering. Prophecy is ministering to a degree, but I'm, I'm here to, uh, I'm here to minister to you, uh, blessings to you. Um, just something that I, something that I heard in my spirit, uh, that I would like to, uh, that I would like to share with you. So, um, for those of you, for those of you that are joining, um, I would really appreciate, um, if you invite your, invite your followers, uh, I promise you that what it is I am about to, uh, communicate, um, it's going to be a very, very, very empowering for you, very strengthening for you. So if you could invite your followers, I would really, really, really appreciate it. For those of you that are coming in, um, just go ahead, go ahead and invite your followers. For those of you that are coming in, I would really, really appreciate that. Uh, blessings to, uh, to everybody. Hopefully you're having a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. Um, it regards as to where you are and what you're going through. Listen, it's just, it's a wonderful day to be alive. My motto is this, if you can breathe again, you can live again. Because every time you breathe again, God gives you an opportunity to start all over again. So for those of you that are coming on, please invite your followers. And uh, I'm going to get, give it a couple of minutes and get right into it. Blessings to uh, blessings to everybody. Blessings to everybody. Um, if you're here for the very first time, if you're here for the very first time, uh, blessings to you, Miss Korea. Appreciate you. If you're here for the very first time, if you could make known your name and the city and state, of course, in which you're scoping from. Blessings to you, uh, Sister Carter. Good to see you. If you can make known the city and state, of course, in which you're scoping from, um, I would love to. Uh, I would love to give you. Uh, a shout out if you are here if you're here for the very 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 first time I would love to give you a shout out if you're here so if you're here for the first time uh, if you can give me the city and state in which you're scoping from a first name or last name at Leah tomorrow blessings to you good to see you good to see you appreciate you hey Madison from Wisconsin uh, blessings to you good to see you as well Good to see you as well. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Well, listen, I'm I'm just going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in uh, to what it is I, I want to share. Um, it was something that God was speaking uh, to me um, right at about, I, I would say right at about maybe five or literally ten minutes ago, um, something that God was speaking to me concerning um, in relation to where people are in this season, in this time, in this hour, uh, and for many uh, in, in this juncture uh, where, where they're living is concerned. And uh, this particular scope, this scope is, uh, is majorly uh, for those of you who have literally uh, run out of gas. Melbourne, Australia. Uh, good to have you. Thank you for joining. Really, really appreciate you. Uh, this scope is majorly for those uh, in whom have uh, literally run out of gas. Uh, your your tank, and of course, when I speak in reference to gas, I'm I'm not talking about your car. I'm um, kind of using that as a metaphor. Uh, when I speak in reference to gas, I'm, I'm talking about your strength uh, to move on, your, your, your vigor to, uh, to press on. Uh, this scope is majorly for those who are feeling like uh, you have literally at this juncture uh, in, in, in this season and, of course, in this hour uh, of your life, you literally feel like uh, your your tank uh, is is past e. Your your car has uh, has run out of gas, and uh, you you're in a place where 
where your tank is so empty until you don't even have the fumes of gas anymore. You don't you don't even have the vapor uh, of gas anymore. You're you, you're in a season you're in a season and a juncture um, of your life uh, where you are so out of strength and and you have become so weak in and 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 with of yourself and and you're so empty until you don't even have the residue anymore you don't have the mist of gas anymore you don't even have the the condensation of gas anymore this scope is for those of you who are in a place where you literally feel as though you have absolutely nothing left. Um, if, if you're not in that place, uh, this scope is not for you. Uh, I've literally come, I've literally come to minister and, and to pour into people who have reach this juncture in their life where you literally feel as though you have absolutely nothing left and uh, your tank is running on empty. Uh, you, you, you're in this place where your, your get up and go has literally got up and gone. This this is a scope. This is a scope for those of you. This is a scope for those of you who are, who are in that place. You are in a place where literally your, your get up and go has, has literally got up and gone. And uh, while everybody is speaking to their neighbor, and, and high-fiving their neighbor and encouraging their neighbor to push and encouraging their neighbor to press. Um, if, if the truth be told, if the truth be told, you're sitting in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning with no push and with no press. If, if, if you're not in that place, this this scope is not for you. This scope this scope is not for you. I'm 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 here. I'm here. I'm here to minister to people. I'm I'm here to talk to people. I'm here to pour into people whose get up and go has literally got up and gone. I'm I'm here. I'm here to minister to people and to pour into people and 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 to talk to people whereby when others are in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning doing the worship hour and everybody's talking about, you know, uh, uh, touch your neighbor and tell them to push and touch your neighbor and tell them to press, you're literally sitting there. You're literally sitting there in all honesty saying to yourself, I can't play anymore. I can't fake it anymore because if the truth be told, I have no push and uh, I, I have I have no press. I, I, I can't touch my neighbor and, and act like I still have push in me. I, I can't high five my best friend and act like I still have have press in me because if 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 the truth be told, if the truth be told, this is where many of us are. If if the truth be told, if if I can be honest with my neighbor. And if I can be open with my neighbor, if I can be, if I can be transparent with my neighbor, if I can be scientitious with my neighbor, uh, if the truth be told, I have no push and I have no press. Some of us are in the season where we literally have no push and we have no press. And, and we're tired, we're tired, we're, 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 we're exhausted, we're, we're depleted, we're, 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 we're bankrupt. We're tired of going to church from Sunday to Sunday, touching our neighbor, talking about push, talking, touching our neighbor, talking about press, when all actuality, we have no push and we have no press. 
because we are mentally tired. We are spiritually drained and we are emotionally bankrupt. We're physically tired. We're physically tired. We're spiritually drained. And we are emotionally bankrupt. And I want you to hear me. Please get this. If you don't get this, you're going to miss this. Uh, I said, if you don't get this, you're going to miss this because I am about to say something uh, that is going to sound a bit contradictory and paradoxical. I'm about to say something that's going to sound a bit contradictory and paradoxical. Stay with me. It's going to sound contradictory and it's going to sound paradoxical if you are in a place if you're in a place where your tank is past E, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about a tank of gas that's on E, but I'm talking about a tank that's literally past E, that you have no fumes left, you have no vapor left, you have no, no condensation left, you, you, have, no, you have no residue left, you, you have no strength left, you you have no push left. You have no press left. If, if you're in a place, if you're in a place, and listen to me, again, it is going to sound paradoxical. It is going to sound contradictory. If you are in a place where you have no push, where you have no press, your tank is past E, your get up and go, has literally got up and gone if you are in that place. Here it is. Watch this now. Here it is. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. If you are in that place, you are right where God wants you to be. I told you, I told you it was going to sound contradictory. I told you it was going to sound paradoxical. If you are in that place, if you are in that place where you get up and go, has literally got up and gone, and your tank is literally past E, you have no gas left, you have no fumes left, you have you have no you have no residue left you you have you have no condensation left if you're in a place where your get up and go has literally got up and gone you are right where god wants you to be you're right where god wants you to be because for many of us that are here you thought you were everywhere but where God wanted you to be. Because, because you were defining, watch this now, you were defining where you are by your emotional state. You were defining where you are by your emotional state. And emotions can be cataclysmic. Emotions can be, can be chaotic. Emotions can be deceptive because they have a way of deceiving you and making you think that you are not where you really need to be when in all actuality you really are. You really are. If, if you're in that place tonight where you literally have no gas in your tank, there's no fumes, there's no condensation, there's no residue, your get up and go has got up and gone, your tank is literally past E, you literally have nothing left, you are right where God wants you to be. There is a situation in the in 2 Corinthians, and don't get ahead of me because I want to minister this. Don't, don't get ahead of me because I want to take my time and I want to really minister this and I want everything to connect. So I want you to hear me, hear me. There is a situation uh, in, in, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
uh, for those of us in whom are intimate with that particular text. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul has had this divine encounter. Paul has had this divine encounter. Paul, Paul has had this, he has had in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he has had this mind-blowing divine encounter. And, and, and he has literally, the word of God tells us that he has literally been caught up to the third heaven. Uh, he has not been caught up to the first heaven. He's not talking about the first heaven. He's not talking about the second heaven, but he says that he was caught up to the third heaven. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll begin reading right at about verse 1. He says, it is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man. Uh, he says, I knew a man. I knew a man. And he's actually talking in the third person, but he's talking in reference to himself. He's speaking rather in reference to himself. He's talking in the third person, but he's speaking in reference to himself. He says in verse two, he says, I knew a man in Christ Jesus uh, about 14 years ago, whether in the body or I cannot tell or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. He says, God knoweth such in one caught up to the third heaven. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, which lets us know, which gives us insight, revelation and understanding uh, into the fact that there are actually, according to Second Corinthians chapter 12, there are actually, watch this now, three heavens. There are actually three heavens. Paul says that I was, watch this, he says, he says in Second Corinthians chapter 12, right about verse 2, he says, Pastor Pitts, I was caught up to the third heaven. I was caught up to the third heaven, which gives me to know that there are actually, watch this now, three heavens. Number one, there is an atmospheric heaven uh, where you and I reside, where you and I reside. There is an atmospheric heaven, the place in which you and I dwell. Uh, the place in which you and I reside is defined or described as the atmospheric heaven. There is what's called, number one, the atmospheric heaven. Uh, number two, there is what's called the planetary heaven. Uh, the planetary heaven uh, is, of course, where the planets reside. It is, of course, where the sun resides, where the moon resides. It's, it's, it's where Pluto resides. It's, it's where Uranus resides. It's, the, 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 it's where the stars reside. The, the planetary heaven is, is where the sun resides and, and the moon resides. Paul says, I was, I was not caught up, watch this now, uh, into the atmospheric heaven, nor was I caught up into the planetary heaven. He says, watch this, I was caught up into the third heaven, the third heaven. The third heaven in the Hebraic is the word Shemayim. The third heaven in the Hebraic, the heaven in which Paul is speaking in reference to uh, is, is what it's called in the Hebraic, the, the Shemayim, which simply means the heights of the heights, the heights of the heights. Paul says, when I was ushered into this place, I was ushered into a place where God himself dwells. I was ushered into the third heaven, not the atmospheric heaven uh, where you and I reside and dwell, not the planetary heaven where the sun and the moon and the stars reside and dwell. He says, but I was literally caught up to the Shemayim. The word, the Hebraic for heaven is the word Shemayim, which simply means the heights of the heights. He says, I was caught up to this place where God himself dwells. And when I got to where I got to, when God brought me to where he brought me to, Paul says where I was ushered into was so real. It was so, it was so touchable. He says it was so tangible. He says that I couldn't even tell whether I was in the body or out of the body. Only God knoweth, he says in verse three. He says, he says, where I was, where I was, was, was so real. 
Where I was was so seeable. Where I was was so physically touchable. Where I was was so physically tangible until Paul says, I don't even know whether I was in the body or out of the body. And he goes on to say, only God knows. And, and he talks about how that he was caught up to a place whereby he heard a language that wasn't even lawful for a man to utter. He says in verse 4, he says how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul says, when I got to this place, when I got to the Shemayim, when I got to heaven, when I got to the place where God himself dwelt, watch this now. He says, I heard a conversation that I can't even repeat. I heard a conversation that would be against the very laws of God for me to come back down to mankind and rehearse and recite what it is that, that I heard. So, so when Paul, when Paul gets caught up, when he gets caught up into the third heaven, watch this now, he moves on and he begins to explain how that there was given to him a thorn in the flesh. He says, lest I should be exalted above measure. Get this now, get this, get this, don't miss this. He says, lest I should be exalted, right about verse 7, he says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations that was given to me, he says, there was given to me, watch this now, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Watch this. A messenger of Satan to, to buffet me. He says, I, watch this, I was the recipient of the thorn. But I want people to understand that the enemy was not the giver of the thorn. Hear this. He says God was. Watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. He says, he says, unless I be exalted above measures, you got to get this because I'm about to help somebody. He says, unless I be exalted above measures, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger, watch this now, of Satan to buffet me. I want you to understand that Satan did not send the thorn. The thorn, watch this now, the thorn was actually given to me. The thorn was given to me. The thorn was given to me. Watch this. If the thorn was given to him, the question comes about who gave it. Stay with me. Stay with me. I'm about to drop you down into something. He says, there was given to me, unless I be exalted above measures through the abundance of revelations that was given to me. He says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. He doesn't say that Satan, you better get this. He doesn't say that Satan was the giver of the thorn. But what he says is that the devil used what was given to buffet me. He used what was given to torment me. He used what was given to frustrate me. He used what was given to aggravate me. He does not say that it was the devil who gave him the thorn. He says it was a messenger of Satan to buffet me. That was given to me. Now here's a question. Here's a question. If Satan didn't give the thorn, where did it came? Where did it come from? There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. But watch this now. Watch this. When you look at the scripture above that, he says, lest I should be exalted above measure. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Except I be exalted above measure. He says, he says, so that I would not get caught up in myself. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. 
a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Watch this. He said, in other words, in other words, Paul says the very thing that God was trying to use to humble me. He says the enemy was trying to use to destroy me. He says the very thing that God was trying to use to strengthen me, the enemy was trying to use to weaken me. Paul says the very thing that God was trying to use to perfect me, he said the devil was trying to use to break me. The very thing that God was trying to use to mature me was the very thing that the devil was trying to use to annihilate me. The very thing that God was trying to use to build me up was the very thing that the devil was trying to use to tear me down. Paul says the very thing that God was trying to use to make me was the very thing that the enemy was trying to use to break me. You're in a season whereby God is using situations and circumstances around you to humble you. The devil's trying to use it to destroy you. God's trying to use it to perfect you. The enemy's trying to use it to break you. God is trying to use it to strengthen you. The devil's trying to use it to weaken you. God is trying to use it to mature you, but the enemy is trying to use it to annihilate you. God is trying to use it to build you up, but the devil is trying to use it to tear you down. God is trying to use those situations and those circumstances to make you, but the enemy is trying to use them to break you. Paul says... Lest I should be exalted above measures through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Except I should be exalted. There was given to me a thorn. The thorn was given, Paul says, to really humble me. But the devil took what God was trying to use to humble me. And he was trying to use it to frustrate me. There was given to me, he says, the thorn in the flesh. Watch this now. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. The, the messenger, the word buffet means to frustrate. The word buffet means to aggravate. The word buffet means to, to discourage. The word buffet means to, to distress. The word buffet means to torment. He, Satan says, or, or, or Paul says rather, Paul says that the very thing that God was trying to use to humble me, the very thing that God was trying to use to strengthen me, the very thing that God was trying to use to mature me and to discipline me was the very thing that the enemy was trying to use to torment me. Then he goes on to say this. He says, and I, watch this now, and I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. This, this thing that the enemy was trying to use to, to buffet me. This thing that the devil was trying to use to torment me. This thing that the enemy was trying to use to destroy me, to frustrate me, to, 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 to aggravate me, to, to no ends. This thing that the devil was trying to use to, to defeat me and to depress me and to discourage me. He says three times. I went to God and I besought. The word besought simply means to intensifiably beg. It means to intensifiably petition. When Paul says that I besought the Lord, he says, I want you to have an understanding that this was not a, a casual prayer conversation that I had with God. He, he's, he's, not, he's not casually praying in conversation. He says, but I besought the Lord thrice. I intensifiably went to God and I literally begged God to remove this thorn from my flesh.
Many of us, many of us don't even know. We don't know what the thorn is because, because the Spirit of God has allowed it to be anonymous. We don't, we don't know. We really don't know what Paul was dealing with. Of course, we can try to use our imagination. We can try to use our imagination in relation to what Paul was really going through, but, 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 but we really don't know. We really don't know because the Spirit of God, watch this now, is silent about what Paul was dealing with because there are some things that you and I go through that's just between you and God. There are some things that you and I go through that are just between us and God. The scripture does not make known what Paul is struggling with. It doesn't make known what he's being tormented by. It doesn't make known what he's being buffeted by because there are some things that are just between you and God. But, but whatever Paul, whatever, listen to me, whatever Paul, was dealing with, whatever Paul was dealing with, whatever Paul was dealing with, it had gotten to him so until Paul says, I went to God and I literally begged him. The word besought, besought simply means to intensifiably beg. Paul says, I was not just casually praying. This was not just a casual, a casual conversation. He says, I literally begged God with every ounce of strength that I had left in me to remove this thorn from my flesh. Listen to how God responds. Watch this. And God said that my grace is sufficient for thee. Watch this. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Indirectly, watch this now, indirectly, indirectly, what God has actually answered Paul was no. I am not going to remove that thorn from your flesh. When God says my grace is sufficient, my grace is sufficient, what he's actually saying is that I am not going to to remove it. Watch this now. There are some things that you are praying for God to remove out of your way in this season and in this juncture of your life that God will not remove out of your way. He won't remove it. He won't remove it. Paul, God says to Paul, God says to Paul, he says, if I remove this thorn out of your flesh, I'm afraid that you're going to get caught up in yourself. Because remember, Paul said that the thorn had actually come lest he should be exalted above measures. Because you, you've got, listen, you've got to understand what has transpired in the transitioning of the text. Don't don't miss it. You've got to understand what has transpired in the transitioning of the text. Paul has gone somewhere where no other man has ever gone before. And God says in order to keep you humble, in order to keep you in tune with yourself, in order to keep you in touch with yourself. He says I've got to I'll watch this now. I've got to allow something to come that's going to keep you depending on me. That's going to keep you calling on me. That's going to keep you leaning on me. That's going to keep you depending on me. There are some things that you're asking God to remove in this season that God says, I am not going to remove because the very thing that you want God to remove is the very thing that's keeping you praying. It's the very thing that's keeping you praising. It's the very thing that's keeping you worshiping. It's the very thing that's keeping you on your face seeking God. And God says, I'm afraid that if I move Move that very thing that you're asking me to move, you won't have a reason to pray anymore.
can, can, can I tell you, can I tell you, can I tell you that there are some things that you deal with in life. There are some things that we deal with in life that God will remove, that God will deliver us from, that God will set us free from. But there are other things in life that God will choose not to deliver us from not to set us free from because God understands that it's that very thing. Every last one of us has a that very thing in our lives. God understands that it is that very thing. It is that very thing that's going to keep you depending on him. God says, Paul, I can't remove this thing. I, I can't. There are other thorns that I have removed, but God says this thorn I can't remove because this thorn is going to keep you humble. This thorn is going to keep you prayerful. This thorn is going to keep you leaning on me. This thorn is going to keep you depending on me. There are some of us that are dealing with some thorns that God will not move. Because those thorns are keeping us humble, keeping us in tune with ourselves. Those thorns are keeping us depending on God. Those thorns are keeping us relying on God. Those thorns are keeping us prayerful. God says, if I remove that, if I deliver you from that, if I take that away from you, I'm afraid you're not going to pray anymore and you're not going to seek me anymore. He says to Paul in verse 9, he says, my grace, my grace is sufficient for thee, watch this now, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. For my strength, here it is, is made perfect in in weakness for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You are in what? Listen to me. Listen to me. You are in no better place with God than when you are at your weakest and lowest point. That's why I stated earlier that if you'll get up and go, has got up and gone, you are right where God wants you to be. If you're in a place where your tank is so empty that you don't have fumes, you don't have residue, you don't have condensation. You, you don't even have the vapor of gas. If you are in that place where you are literally bankrupt and depleted of your own strengths, you are right where God wants you to be. You are in no better place with God than when you are at your weakest point where you have got to this place where you say, God, I just can't do this anymore. And the Lord says, you're right where I want you to be. You're right, you're right, you are right where I want you to be. I've been waiting on you to tell me you can't push no more. I've been waiting for you to tell me that you can't press anymore. I've been waiting for you to tell me that you don't have strength to move on anymore. Because when you don't have strength to move on anymore, watch this now, that's when the strength of God becomes alive in you. If you are in a place where you have no push, you have no press, you have no more strength to move on, the Lord told me to tell you that's exactly where he wants you to be because that's when the strength of God ignites in you. That's when the strength of God begins to live in you. That's when the strength of God becomes alive in you. God says, I've been waiting for this. I, listen, I've been sitting back. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. God says, I've been sitting back on the throne, chilling, waiting for you to tell me you can't do this anymore. Let me give some light on this subject. Give me a minute. My God, I feel the glory. 
I feel the glory. God, listen, God says that I've been waiting. I've been waiting. I've, I've been waiting for you to tell me you can't do it anymore. I've, I've been waiting for you to tell me that you have no more strength. I've been waiting for you to tell me that your tank is on eat. I've been waiting for you to tell me that your get up and go has got up and gone because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Listen, remember when, remember when, remember when, when Lazarus was sick and, and, and Mary and Mary and Martha, Mary and Martha, uh, they, they go to Jesus and, and say, and, and they say, uh, Lord, uh, Lazarus in, in whom thou lovest is sick. And, and the scripture says that Jesus doesn't rush to get to Lazarus. In order to heal Lazarus, in order to deliver Lazarus, in order to set Lazarus free. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Bible says that he literally waits until Lazarus is four days stinking in the grave. And when Jesus gets there, Mary and Martha are boohooing. I mean, they, they are literally in tears. And Jesus says to Mary... And to Martha, he says, listen, I want you to dry your eyes, dry your eyes. He says, because you will see Lazarus again. And, and they respond by saying, Mary and Martha replied to Jesus by saying, I know that we're going to see him again. And I mean, listen, they are just, they are just torn. They are torn beyond emotional belief. They are, they are a wreck at this time. They says, listen, I know, I know, I know that we're going to see Lazarus again and we're going to see him in the resurrection. And Jesus opens his mouth and responds by saying, I am the resurrection. <laughs> listen, li hey, listen, Jesus was bad. <laughs> Y'all ain't listening. I said Jesus was bad. They, they, said, they said, yes, we will see him again in the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am what you've been waiting on. I, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I am what you've been waiting on. What, what, watch this now. Uh, this is only for those who have ears to hear. This is only for everybody. Listen, everybody's not going to catch this. And I know that everybody's not going to catch this. Mary and Martha say, we will see him again in the resurrection. Jesus responds by saying, I am the resurrection. In other words, I presently am what you've been waiting for. This is only for those who have ears to hear. What you've been waiting for is already here. There's my, there's my administrative assistant. Bless you, Sister Vicky. I said this is only for those who have ears to hear. What you've been waiting for is already here. The Bible says that, that he doesn't come to bring healing and deliverance to Lazarus when he's sick. The Bible says, watch this now, that he waits until Lazarus is four days stinking in the grave. And then he goes to the grave site and says, Lazarus, come out of there. And the scripture says that nobody but Lazarus came out. Because watch this, had Jesus said, come out of there, everybody who was dead would have got up and walked. <laughs> Y'all ain't listening. I said, had Jesus came and to the gravesite and said, come out of there, everybody who was dead would have got up and walked. But he literally came to the gravesite and he calls Lazarus by name. Listen, when it's your time, it's your time. Hear me by the Holy Ghost. My God, I don't mean to prophesy, but I can't help it. Hear me by the Holy Ghost. I don't care how dead your situation may seem from an external perspective. I don't care how dead it may seem. I don't care how far gone it may seem. When it is your time, Jesus knows your name and he knows exactly where you are. Some of you all are in a season where, where you are right where God wants you to be. 
See, because God says, I didn't want to heal you and deliver you when things were still moving for you, when things were still shaking for you, when things were still quivering for you. He says, I literally wanted to wait until the situation was dead and buried. See, for some of you all, listen to me, listen to me. For some of you all, your situation has too much breath in it. Jesus says, I'm trying to wait until it literally dies and stop breathing. Uh, listen, because when I deliver you, I want people to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was nobody but me. You want Jesus to come. Well, you better get this in the Holy Ghost. You want him to come while the situation is sick. Now, Jesus says, I don't want to come while the situation is sick. He says, I want to come when the situation dies. Because I want folk to know that it was nobody but God who could have gotten, my God, I feel the glory. It was nobody but God who could have gotten you out of that. Some of y'all situations are still breathing and that's why he ain't doing nothing because he says, I want, I want to wait until the situation has been dead and in the grave stinking. I want to come in when people look at you and say it's over. They ain't getting up again. They ain't breathing again. They ain't walking again. They ain't talking again. I want to come to deliver you when everybody has counted you out. My, he says, listen now, listen, listen, listen. He knows your name. Are you with me? He called Lazarus by name. He knows your name. I decree and declare that he's about to call your name. He says, he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. I'm going to say this and I'm done. When you've gotten to the place, when you've gotten to the place where there's literally no more strength left within you. I mean, you, you are in this place where you have nothing left. God says, I want you to understand that you are right where I want you to be. That's when the strength of God ignites within you. Somebody says you have broke it down, man of God. Blessings to you, Monica. Blessings. That's when, that's when the strength of God ignites in you. Paul had literally gotten to a place where, where, where the enemy who had come to buffet him or to torment him, Paul had literally, literally gotten to a place where he was physically, mentally, and emotionally depleted, bankrupt, and drained. The apostle Paul this mighty anointed man of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Are y'all listening? I said this mighty anointed man of God. I'm, listen, I'm talking about a man of God who was so anointed until devils would flee in his presence. I'm, I'm talking about a man of God who was so anointed that they would literally take aprons from his body and lay it on the sick in other cities where he was not present and healing, where he was not present rather, and healing and deliverance would come to the sick. This man of God who was so anointed of God, watch this, had reached the place where he was mentally bankrupt where he was emotionally depleted, where he was spiritually drained because of what he was going through in that season of his life. Please hear me when I say this. Please hear me. And, and I'm about to get real close. I'm about to get up close and personal when I say this because I want you to get this and hear this. It matters not how powerful you are. It matters not how anointed you are. 
It matters not how great you are, how awesome you are. There are times in all of our lives when we're going to come encounter with seasons whereby we are mentally depleted, emotionally bankrupt, and spiritually drained. No matter how anointed you are, that's where Paul is. That's where this mighty anointed man of, man of God is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He have reached that place and he says, God, listen, I can't take no more. Remove this thorn from my flesh. I, I can't do it anymore. I can't, I can't take it anymore. I, I can't deal with it anymore. God, watch this. God says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And I'm about to show you how strong you really are. Please, please hear me when I say this. Please hear me when I say this. And, 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 and I'm about to drop you down. I'm about to drop you down into, into another revelation. All right. I'm about to drop you down into another revelation. One of the worst things that you could ever do is tell God what you can't deal with. One, one, of the, one of the worst things that you could ever do is tell God that you can't take no more. It, listen, it is one of the worst things. It is one of the worst things that you could ever do. Going to God, telling God what you can't take no more is like going to God, telling God or asking God to give you patience. Lord, give me patience and give it to me in a hurry. God says it don't happen. It don't happen like that. It don't happen like that. Go, going to God, telling God what you can't do. It's just like going to God, asking God to humble you. God says, you don't want me to humble you. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. God says, I want you to humble you. You Whatever you do, listen. For those of you, for those of you, for those of you, for those of you who are trying to be so spiritual that you've been going to God to my Lord, keep me humble. Listen, that's one of the worst prayers that you could ever pray. If you've ever prayed that prayer, stop it today. Stop right now. Are you listening to me? Don't go to God anymore talking about, Lord, keep me humble. Because God knows what to do in order to keep you humble. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what he's doing to Paul without Paul even having to ask for it. God knows how to keep you humble. You don't have to ask him to keep you humble. And if you've ever prayed that prayer before, please stop as of tonight. Don't go to God. Tell my Lord, keep me humble. God says, you don't want me to humble you. Humble yourselves. That's what the word of God says. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he might exalt you in due season. One of the worst things that you could ever do is go to God and say, God, I can't take no more. I can't take no more. I can't do this no more because God has a way of showing you just how much more you can take. I, listen, I don't ever want to be found going to God saying, Lord, I just can't do this no more. God, I just can't take this no more. God, I'm at my wit's end because God says, son, I'm going to show you how much more you could really take. Listen, sometimes it's better to just go through what you have to go through and just go through it. Did everybody get that revelation? I'm going to say it again. I said sometimes it's better to just go through what you have to go through and just go through it. Don't mumble. Don't grumble. Don't complain. Don't tell God what you can't take, what you can't go through, what you can't do anymore. Listen, God knows what he's doing with you. Are y'all listening? God knows what he's doing with you. 
God knows what he's allowing you to go through. And he also understands the reason as to why he's allowing you to go through. Just go through what you have to go through and go through it. Because that's exactly what you're going. You're going through it. Listen, you're not stopping in it. You're going through it. David said in Psalms 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You're listen, wherever you are, wherever you are, you are not purposed to stop in it. You are purposed to go through it. Are you listening to me? I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I said, wherever you are, wherever you are. You are not purposed to stop in it. You are purposed to go through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley. Watch this now. Get this and I'm done. Every entrance has an exit. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I said every entrance has an exit. And just like you entered into a situation, God says, I want you to have an understanding that, there, that there's also a door out of this situation. I will put no more on you than what you could bear. Stop telling God what you can't take. I will not. God says, I will not put any more on you than what you can bear. And will with the test have already prepared the way of escape. What Listen, whatever it is that you're going through, you were made to go through it. You were purposed to go through it. You were anointed to go through it. You can't go through what I'm going through because I'm anointed to go through what I'm going through. I can't go through what you're going through because you are anointed to go through what you are going through. Whatever it is you're going through, God says, I want you to have an understanding. I make no mistake. You're anointed to go through what you're going through. And because you're anointed, you're going to make it. Because you're anointed, you're going to make it. Listen, listen. If you're in a season where you have no strength, you're right where God wants you to be. You're right where God wants you to be. Because his strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you, when you are at your weakest point, when you're in this place where you have no strength left, that's when the strength of God and the power of God ignites on the inside of you. And watch this now. And gives you the will to win. If you're in a place where you are about to give up, and I'm going to end with this. God is about to give you the will to win. Because his strength is about to be made perfect in your weakness. God is about to give you the will to win. For those of you that were on the verge, that were on the edge, that was on the peripherals of giving up, throwing in the tower, Lying down, dying, waving the white flag of surrender. God says it's not over yet. You're right where he wants you to be. The strength of God is about to ignite in you. And God's going to give you the will to win. And you will not quit. You will not quit. You will not die. You will not wave the white flag of surrender. This is your season. This is your hour. Watch God. Well, blessings to you. I'm out of here. Just wanted to drop something in your spirit. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right? Blessings to everybody.